never be before, and I understand I cannot exercise. Well, that is actually very untrue. There are very specific exercises that, and, and uh, types of exercises which can be extremely helpful. Evidently, there are, there are restrictions. There are some exercises like a high-impact aerobics that would not be appropriate. Um, but in the course of my presentation, I will be addressing the kinds of exercises which can be very helpful for somebody with inflamed joints. The second scenario, a little bit more common, is the person who comes to see me and lets me know they're a little bit nervous. They know I'm a physiotherapist. The doctor has one, is asking, asking them to come to see me. But they've been for physiotherapy in the past, and it only aggravated their symptoms. They had more pain, perhaps on sort of, of swelling, and they quit going because of, of, this, of this situation. When I question them about the exercises that they were taught, I find out that they were given exercises where there was a lot, a lot of movement of the joints against resistance. So, for example, a person with knee arthritis, the therapist rightfully decided that they wanted to strengthen the thigh muscles to help give better protection for the, to the knee, but gave them an exercise where, for example, they would be sitting in a chair, maybe a weight on their ankles, and lifting their foot up to straighten the knee, holding for several seconds, and then relaxing and lowering the foot. This would definitely be an excellent exercise for strengthening the thigh muscles, but could obviously aggravate the joint in the process of doing so. So, as I say, these are the kinds of, of scenarios that I, I do hear about and are commonly issues which have um, put up roadblocks for people to, to, who are wanting to exercise. And I will address these during my presentation. Now, I was given instructions about how to change the slide, but I don't see the arrows I was asked to use. I don't know how to change the slide on this computer. I don't see the arrows, but I was going to be sent to Okay. Here. Okay. Just want to say okay. So the objectives for my presentation today, as you can see, are to help you understand the importance of exercise in the treatment of arthritis, to help you understand how to uh, properly prescribe an exercise program for individual clients who have arthritis, and how to adapt an exercise program, taking into consideration individual factors such as stage of readiness, psychosocial issues, culture, disease stage, and so on. I've broken up my presentation into the subheadings, which are the signs and symptoms which you will find when assessing somebody and working with somebody who has arthritis. And you can see those in front of you. Pain, swelling, issues with range of motion, decreased strength, challenges with function and activities of daily living, challenges in terms of maintaining fitness, the presence of joint deformities, and various factors which can affect emotional status. When a person is, is experiencing pain, it may seem counterintuitive to realize to find out that actually doing activity can oftentimes help with the pain. As recently as only about 40 years ago, people who were diagnosed with an inflammatory form of arthritis were actually put on bed rest, sometimes for weeks, sometimes even for months sometimes for several different occasions during the course of their lifespan. We now realize that activity is actually important, but back then there was such a fear that any activity at all would cause damage to the joints that they were greatly discouraged from doing even normal functional activities. Gentle range of motion, which I will describe a little bit in more a bit more detail later in the in the presentation, uh, can be performed. Walking can often be very helpful. If a person is limping, it's very important to prescribe a cane for them to use. Limping will add increased, increased stress to the, of the better leg and also increase a lot of stress to the back and can create problems which are not as necessary. If they are unsteady with a, with a cane, a walker can be extremely helpful 
and really, as much as that can be a huge emotional leap for a person to have to consider using a walker, it is oftentimes experienced by the people that I've, I've helped with this big adjustment that they actually feel as though, as though their life has opened back up for them again and they're able to be much more active and be able to function at a much higher level. Mm-hmm. Breaking the walks and other forms of activity up into small portions can be an extremely helpful aspect of care. For example, somebody will often say to me, I used to exercise, I used to go for walks for 30 minutes a day and now I cannot do that. But when I question them, I find out that they can easily do 10-minute walks and perhaps they may be able to do that two times a day and be able to maintain, the, help, help them maintain the fitness levels that they're used to attaining. Somebody who's not able to walk for 10 minutes, maybe could walk for five and do that two or three times a day and slowly work up as they're able to. This is much, much easier on an arthritic joint. Another item that I haven't actually got on the slide here, which is an important part of movement, is that in actual fact, the cartilage is actually nourished by the movement that takes place during activity. The final point on this slide is that of hydrotherapy. I cannot recommend highly enough water classes for almost anybody with any form of arthritis. The warmth and buoyancy of the water can make exercises so much easier to perform, both for maintaining range of motion as well as for strengthening. In the case of joint swelling, studies are actually very inconclusive as to whether exercise can actually help with decreasing joint swelling. However, there's a great deal of evidence that it's extremely important to be aware of the joints that are swollen, that are active, or what we call active, when describing an exercise program in order to help prevent causing an exacerbation. When there's, decreased, when there's pain, the decreased range of motion is oftentimes a result. And the reason for that is that people naturally try to avoid movement in order to avoid the pain. This oftentimes will result in stiffness and or contractures of the joint, leading to further increased pain and a further decrease or concern in the client about movement. Another issue here is that a decrease in flexibility, in other words, tightness around it of the soft structures around the joint can lead to an increased risk of injury. In the case of inflammatory arthritis, when there's an acute phase of inflammation present, range of motion exercises can be performed and are done so within a pain-free range, perhaps nudging the limit of this range. Only two times a day, only just a handful of repetitions with short holds are very effective and is all that's needed for this, for this type of situation. The goal with somebody who has an acute inflammation present is to maintain the range. It's very unlikely that you will be able to increase the range during this acute phase. In the case of inflammatory arthritis that is subsiding or maybe has become chronic but inflammation is gone, or in the case of osteoarthritis, the more common form of arthritis, the frequency and the numbers of repetitions can be increased. Stretching exercises become appropriate at this time. And this is one of the one important point here that I want to make. People will oftentimes stretch a several repetitions, perhaps for five or ten second holds. When you first stretch a muscle, if you, if you go into a stretch position for a particular muscle, something called a stretch reflex comes into play, and it's likely a defense mechanism our body has, which helps us not to overstretch and tear the muscle. The muscle tightens, the stretch reflex causes the muscle to tighten in that stretch position and not allow you to go further without a great increase in chain. However, within about 15 seconds or so, that stretch reflex eases off, and you can attempt gently to check to see if the muscle will stretch slightly further. So holding that for another 15 seconds or so leads to a much more effective stretching exercise as opposed to a number of the short stretches which in my view are not nearly as effective. And the research does support that. Range of motion exercises at bedtime can actually result in a decrease of morning sickness, a very common part of having our diet. The use of cold for inflamed joints just simply cools down the inflammation. And this can be done in a number of ways. For example, a person can wrap some ice in a damp 
washcloth or hand towel and wrap the knuckles of their fingers if they are at the base of the fingers if those joints are inflamed. A larger towel obviously could be used for the ice for an inflamed knee. If it's just a couple of finger joints, using an ice tube housing the towel with the opposite hand so you don't freeze the fingers of our hand, and then the ice placed directly against the inflamed finger joint and moves about that joint, top and bottom and side to side as able. We call that an ice massage. This for two or three or four minutes can do a wonderful job of decreasing the inflammation in that joint. The next point is about moist heat, and it may seem like a little bit of a contradiction, but moist heat is also often helpful with osteoarthritis, that is the most common um, temperature modality, if you're thinking about ice and ice and cold, a cold and heat, um, that is the most comfortable and the most helpful with that form of arthritis. With the inflamed joints of an inflammatory arthritis like rheumatoid, the cold is oftentimes helpful. However, moist heat also can be used. So, for example, a person who has rheumatoid arthritis in their hands may get up in the morning with a great deal of stiffness and pain. Soaking their hands for a few minutes in some warm water will help decrease the aching and stiffness present. And then following that with a couple of, of, if they have a couple of joints in their hands that are inflamed, they can use an ice cube to help decrease the inflammation as in bed. Oil and gloves is a great option for uh, what is, is commonly used in, uh, um, in a physiotherapy clinic, that i.e. the back, a wax bath. But putting oil on your hands, putting your hands in rubber gloves and into a sink full of warm water allows the, the oil to heat up because of the heat coming through the rubber gloves to the oil. The oil heats up and it acts like a wax bath. A person can then do exercises in the warm water and, uh, and oftentimes that helps them to move through the morning stiffness a lot, a lot more quickly than otherwise. Being able to relax is really important for the best, for best results with exercise with range of motion and stretching exercises. In or after a shower or warm bath, using music, fitting them into the time of the day when time pressures can be minimized, are all helpful in getting the best results. Again, water classes, is, I cannot recommend highly enough. In the situation with decreased muscle strength, poor muscle strength in people with arthritis may be attributable to a decrease in joint mobility, reflex imposition, atrophy, peripheral nerve impairment, and steroid use. This slide here is extremely important and actually holds one of my main take-home messages for you. I'll go through the slide first and then come back to that particular point. The first one is the use of isometric exercises for inflamed, unstable, or damaged joints. The frequency and the repetition of those exercises, the length of the hold, varies with the condition of the joint and the importance of the exercise. Hydrotherapy, again, is excellent. And the information about Tai Chi for arthritis is extremely interesting. One study focusing on Tai Chi actually showed a 47.5% reduction in falls. And there is a type of Tai Chi that is, is taught uh, in various parts of, of um, certainly here in London, and uh, in various parts of the world. There's a doctor from Australia who came to London several years ago and taught people in the London area how to teach Tai Chi specifically for people who have arthritis. But coming back to the point that I, I really want to make as a take-home message as is the first one about isometric exercises. This takes us to the second scenario I described about the person with the knee arthritis finding that exercise has actually made them feel worse. My choice for exercises to strengthen a person's muscles is that of isometric strengthening or something close to isometric. In other words, an exercise where a person is, is pushing against some resistance to make the muscles work hard, but is actually creating very little, if any, movement. Isometric would actually mean literally no movement with the exercise. So an example of that, with the person who has the near arthritis, what I would do is have them sitting in a comfortable chair, one that supports them right to the knee, in other words, not a, a kitchen chair or a dining room chair where the knee may be sticking out past the, the edge of the chair, preferably a sofa or an armchair. 
and putting their heel up on a stool a little bit lower than where they're seated. So that they're, when their heel is resting on the stool, they are, they are experiencing um, an ability to be able to sit there, relax, their thighs supported, their knees slightly bent, and in a relaxed position. They then lift their heel, say half an inch off the stool or the box, to straighten the knee, hold for 10 seconds, relax the heel back onto the box, and then rest. And this allows the thigh muscles to strengthen, This is what we want. It is important to strengthen muscles around the rectus joint for better protection of that joint, but we need to be able to do the strengthening in a way that does not aggravate the joint in the process. So another example would be somebody who has shoulder arthritis. And if a you know, like more traditional exercise might be to give the person a weight and have them lift their arm up over their head many repetitions, yes, that may strengthen the muscles in the shoulder, but there's a very, very high likelihood that that will aggravate your arthritis in the joint. So for somebody who is wanting to do their exercises at home, what I will often have them do is sit in an armchair where they can push their elbows into the back of the chair, hold for several seconds in the lap, strengthening the muscles at the back of the shoulder. They then can push their elbows sideways into the inside of the arms of the chair, allowing them to strengthen the muscles on the outside of the arm, and then pushing the back of the wrist sideways into the inside of the arms of the chair, strengthening up another group of muscles around the shoulder. If a person's wanting to go to their gym, they can use the same kind of concept of minimizing the movement and holding for longer. So, for example, they, if they are doing an exercise where they're pulling um, a bar from over their head down to their shoulders and that's letting, um, letting their, their hands go back up again, I'm not sure, I wish I could, maybe I can demonstrate that a little bit here, but pulling their arms down with the, with the weight and the bar in their hands and then their arms go back up again, that may very well uh, aggravate arthritis in the, in the shoulders. But if they were to put their hands, if they're able to put their hands into position, the starting position, only pull down maybe an inch or two, hold for 10 seconds and then relax, there's much, much less movement of the shoulders. They can still strengthen their shoulder muscles, the same muscles that do the original movement, the full movement, but with much less action of the joint and therefore much less stress on the joint, allowing them to strengthen the muscles without, without aggravating their arthritis. I'd be happy at the end of the presentation to answer any questions about that because that is a really, really huge take home, key take home message that I'd like to leave you with. In the event or in the case of dynamic strength training, in other words, anything walking, cycling, swimming, dancing, um, activities that have rhythmical arm leg movement. Um, the research shows that people um, are, are ideally able to strengthen the baby to 60 to 85% maximal heart rate. That was what the NHR stands for. If they do this two to three times a week for 30 to 60 minutes. In my practice, I very rarely see people that are exercising at that level. And what I more often well, I'm a, I am more often recommending to an older population or a younger population who's suffering from arthritis is that they do their walking or their cycling or their swimming several times a week, perhaps five to seven times a week, and starting off, as I mentioned in the earlier part of my presentation, with smaller amounts, perhaps two or three five-minute walks, for example, um, and then gradually working up with a goal of a total of 20 or 30 minutes a day. Be careful with dynamic spring training during active inflammatory arthritis. It's excellent, though, for a controlled disease and for osteoarthritis. It has been shown to result in increased strength, increased function, and decreased pain without negative impact when it is described appropriately for the individual person. When function is decreased, some of the items we've already discussed, range of motion, stretching exercises, muscle strengthening, Tai Chi, hydrotherapy, and aerobic exercise that I'm about to speak about, can all be used to help with, dec with decreased function to help improve functional levels. Mm -hmm. 
Again, with any exercise program, begin small, build up very slowly. And a really important point here is that there should be no increase in joint pain. It's not joint issues result in a situation where we don't say if you don't use it, you lose it, or no pain, no gain. It's a, very common if you're starting a new exercise program um, to have some muscle soreness, but we do not want to have any increase in joint pain. What that indicates is, is that there is too much stress moving in the joint area, and the exercise needs to be changed or modified to make it less stressful for the joint. Again, dividing the dynamic or the aerobic exercises into small portions is really helpful. In the event of decreased fitness and a person wanting to improve their physical fitness, these are the results that are shown here of research with people who have rheumatoid arthritis compared to a control group. They actually are showing, and this is a huge contrast to what I was mentioning earlier about having to go on bed rest and avoid even normal functional activities as much as possible. The research shows that there's an increase in fitness, a decrease in joint changes as seen on X-ray, not the increased damage that was predicted initially, decreased use of prednisone, decreased hospital stays, improved joint count. For those of you who are wondering what a joint count is, people who are specialized in rheumatology, whether doctors or therapists, do a joint count where they're assessing the joints of a person who has arthritis to determine which ones are tended to detach, which ones have arthritis, and therefore we call them active. So a high joint count means that a person has many active, i.e. inflamed joints. In this case, again, counterintuitive to what doctors and healthcare professionals thought 40 years ago, there actually was an improvement in the joint count among people in arthritis with rheumatoid arthritis who were exercising appropriately. Again, decreased fatigue and improved emotional well-being were also results of exercise. I like the pictures of people doing things. Pole walking or Nordic pole walking it's a great way to exercise for people who are able to exercise in this way. It obviously provides more stability to the person who is, is walking. I had originally thought that it actually increased the activity level of the energy expenditure by 20%, but when I gave a presentation just recently, a person in the audience came who spoke and spoke to me. She actually teaches Nordic pole walking, and she indicated to me that the research shows that there's actually a 46% increase in energy expenditure because of the use of the arm. I've also read, I have not found where I read this, but I've also read that there's a 30% decrease in stress on the knee when people use the Nordic Pole. So this is a great way of exercising. Exercise precautions, items to be really watchful for when working with people who have arthritis or when you're exercising, creating your own exercise program for yourself. Be aware of hot, swollen joints. Be aware of unstable joints of the lower extremities. Acute systemic inflammatory disease with fatigue, weight loss, fever, and rash certainly would be contraindicated, uh, contraindicate um, very strenuous exercise until that got under control. Perhaps a little range of motion would be, um, and, and joint protection would be the main focus of, of treatment at this time. Uh, the issue of being overweight, one item I want to mention here that is often really encouraging to people who are wanting to lose weight is the fact that for every one pound of weight a person loses, they take four pounds of pressure off their knees. And so a person losing only five pounds immediately takes 20 pounds of pressure off their knees. And this is extremely encouraging for people who feel that they have to maybe lose 50 pounds or, or, or 40 pounds. Uh, they don't need to lose a lot before they've made a significant difference to their joints. In the issue where joint deformity is present, Joints may be unstable and are vulnerable to activity-related injuries, but maintaining or restoring muscle strength and joint mobility are, are important. 
With, in terms of minimizing the, the biomechanical stresses going through a joint, determine the range of motion required for safe, corrupt performance. Use a single plane of motion when the joint is unstable. And I shot down even with a joint that's not unstable but simply is arthritic. It's really helpful often to use a single plane of motion. And a good example of this is I've, I've frequently had people come to see me who found that they've gone to pool classes and have found that they love them, that they're experiencing a great deal of benefit. But, for example, their shoulder is more painful afterwards or their hip is more painful afterwards. And when I ask them what type of exercises they're doing, one of the movements that's oftentimes described, for example, with the hip, is that of creating a large rotation movement at the hip joint. In other words, moving the foot in a large circle at the bottom of the pool. Doing the circular motion with a joint that are gritted is sometimes, a re sometimes results in a great deal of increased pain. So for that same person, they often, they often find they're able to move the joint, for example, moving the foot forward and backward in a straight point, in a single plane of motion in a straight line, and then moving the foot side to side, again, in a single plane of motion. That allows them to cover a lot of the same area as the people who are doing the circular rotation, but doing so with a single, single plane of motion creates an ability for them to do it without aggravating the joint in most cases. The next point is changing the planes of motion slowly. Select activities with minimal joint compression or rotation or shearing at the joint surfaces. Avoid loading or generating resistance rapidly. And oftentimes using short levers, for example, bent elbows, can take stress off the shoulder joint. Again, under the same topic of minimizing biomechanical stresses, Ensure the equipment can accommodate an individual's needs. Can use joint protection, including positioning and alternating activities. Joint protection also has helped with the use of orthotics, splints, and other devices. And choosing low-risk activities can oftentimes be important. But good footwear is extremely important. These are a pair of shoes that I'm sure most people who have worked with older people have seen um, commonly, they are good, excellent supportive shoes without the, the look of the typical running shoe, which a lot, a lot of people do not want to wear running shoes. They want to look a little bit dressier, and this allows them a little bit, maybe not dressiness, but a little bit um, uh, less obvious, supportive, orthotic type of shoe. You can't see quite as well in the picture as what maybe would be ideal. But one thing that can be really helpful with a supportive shoe is if you look at the sole of the shoe, and uh, they, you will see that the, the sole actually will flare outwards around the forefoot and around the heel, providing a great deal of side-to-side -side stability. I've had a, two people, even in just the last three months, one a young person who is very heavy, and one an older person with, with some balance issues, and simply moving into buying and using an excellent pair of supportive shoes astounded them both in terms of the improvement in their balance. Another issue around good supportive shoes is to use, um, to, for most people, uh, having some unusual with some arch support can be extremely helpful. As we get older, most of us find that our feet begin to flatten a little as they, as they um, respond to the years of, of wear and tear and, and weight and, uh, and working for us. And having some, having some arch support can help to realign the foot into a more neutral position and therefore putting the ankle and even the knee and hip into a better position. This diagram here is actually a really simple, easy to, to take in diagram of the benefits of exercising. The first, uh, the first part of the diagram, the thicker section there, the water section, represents people who are not exercising and who exercise very little, and they have a small amount of benefit. B indicates people who are doing moderate activities and they receive quite a, um, a significantly larger amount of benefit. Those people in the C category, those people who are very active, do get a somewhat increased amount of, of, of um, benefit from their exercise, 
but not significantly higher than most uh, people who are exercising at a moderate level. So I think that's a really um, awesome, again, I think encouragement for people that you don't have to go out and run 10 mile marathons to be able to get great results with, with appropriate exercise. Emotional well-being is a really important aspect to be addressed with people who are, are suffering from having arthritis. Pain and decreased function often result in anxiety, depression, a sense of helplessness, and low self-esteem. Exercise restores optimism, a sense of self-empowerment, and well-being. Group exercise programs can be particularly helpful, especially if fun and done to music. The morale that can be um, just from having peer contact and the support of a peer group can be a huge benefit for people to help them stick with a program that they've chosen for themselves. And actually, hydrotherapy and Tai Chi and various advanced, various group exercise programs are seen to be in the long term the most, um, probably the most beneficial because people do stick with them, oftentimes more readily than an expert program they are doing by themselves at home. I like this particular, the bottom point here, I like this, this particular way of, 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 um, of, of describing Tai Chi as being a meditation in motion. Using client-centered goals when working with people with arthritis is extremely important. It's so important to be sensitive to a client's concurrent life issues. In other words, if someone that comes in, they've just been diagnosed as having rheumatoid arthritis, and their spouse is having an extremely difficult time coping with this diagnosis and with their, their partner's inability to be able to continue their normal activities, that may be much more important to address on a particular day at that visit than to teach them, somebody that's teaching them two or three exercises when, um, when their, their emotions are high and, and they're feeling very stressed with, their, with the issues they're coping with at home. There, and I'm sure you're aware of and can think of many other issues which could be, um, I could, you know, could make you want to wait to teach exercises to another session. Awareness of a client's personality and coping skills is also helpful when uh, deciding an exercise program, when dealing with, uh, with their, their issues with arthritis. Awareness of a client's past experience with exercise is important. Uh, and that I, um, I indicated in those two scenarios which I gave at the beginning of our presentation. Sometimes people have been encouraged not to exercise, it was bad for them. Other times people have tried to exercise and, and found out that they, that they had an increase of pain um, and symptoms because of the type of exercises they were doing. It's really important to discuss the client's priorities and goals and not try to impose years upon them. Problem solving with the client is, is often an important part of helping them develop a program for themselves. Talking about location of the exercise, again, somebody may want to exercise at home, but going to a center where there's a pool class or a Tai Chi class or where there's a dance uh, may be much, much more um, stimulating for a person and, and encourage them and help them feel a lot more motivated. Some people like to exercise alone. Some people like, would like to find a friend to exercise with so they can motivate each other. Time of day can make a big difference. Morning stiffness is very common with arthritis and may be, may be a limiting factor at first thing in the morning, although some people find they actually move through the morning stiffness more, more quickly if they do appropriate exercises. Fatigue, particularly at the end of the day, may be a factor that will prevent exercise in the evening. Some people prefer to exercise twice a day. Maybe they have a program where it's been recommended they, they do two sessions of exercise a day, and they prefer that way that once we do 15 or 20 minutes in the morning, the 15 or 20 minutes in the afternoon or evening, and not think about exercise the remainder of the day. Somebody else finds it much easier, especially someone who's busy, finds it much easier perhaps to two or three they like to do before they get out of bed in the morning, a couple they do in the shower, uh, one or two they do at meal time, um, perhaps during lunch break at work or on their coffee break, or during the meeting in the evening. Having motivators is really important. Keeping a diary can be really helpful, and giving oneself treats when successful with follow-through. 
this slide, um, and I'll read it first, is, well, actually, maybe I'll explain it first. Um, this is something that I haven't actually read anywhere or heard anybody say. It's just something that I've become very aware of, and I'm sure all of you healthcare providers out there are very conscious of this as well. It feels to me that the goals of an exercise program and the, the progress um, that you're able to move a patient through in their program is part of a three-way collaboration with ICS. I may, the healthcare provider, may have very specific ideas of what I think a client needs for progress and for health. The client may totally agree with that or may need some, may need some help to, um, to move into that direction or maybe I need some help to, from the client to move into her or his direction in terms of looking at her goals. And also, thirdly, there's the client's body. So I may have my ideas of what I want the person to do. They may have their ideas of what they want to do, but the person's body is going to have the final say, say in those situations. And this is where a client may be, in my next couple of points here, a client may be extremely motivated and actually maybe tending to push themselves too hard. They may need a lot of instruction to help them become more aware of listening to their body for warning signs. Another client may be very frightened about exercising, about causing increased damage, and they may, may, may need to be caught, they may require extra reassurance and education about how to listen to feedback from their body. So in summary, exercise is extremely important. Use your knowledge, use common sense when describing exercises to people, be creative, and call the Air Partner Society if you have any questions. So thank you very much, and I am looking forward to answering questions. Mm -hmm. Will I see questions connected? Okay. Go on to the Absolutely. We'll take turns. We might even just get rid of the chair. Okay. <laughs> All right. Oh, so here's a question. Any guidelines on Tai Chi for long-term care residents? That's a good question. Um, and I'm supposed, to I'm supposed to be here. Right? No, you don't need to now because I'll be here with you. Okay. So we'll go through them together. Okay. All right. Um, I think probably the ideal would be if somebody in the long-term care would be able to learn how to teach Tai Chi and bring that skill to their their the senior home, their nursing home where they work. That'd be an awesome skill to have and something that I think would be fun for their residents and would be a great option for exercise for them. So you said that one pound loss equals how much pressure off their knees? So uh, that, that ratio is, is that for every pound a person loses, they take four pounds of pressure or stress off their knees. You're welcome. So if there are any more questions, now is your chance to ask them. Otherwise, you can certainly Call the Arthritis Society at the phone number listed on the slide. And for those of you who are logged on on the phone, the phone number is 1-800-321-1433. You can also email for information at info at on.arthritis.ca. And the website is www.arthritis.ca. And yes, I do have um, a digital copy of the slide presentation. Would you be willing to let me post it on our website? Absolutely. Okay, so the, the slide presentation will be posted on our website. Our and you can access it there. And if you don't want to do that, you can send me an email directly at dana.vangorp at uwo.ca and I can send you a copy of the slide presentation as well. Any further questions before we sign off? Other questions? Mm -hmm.
Can you hear me? Sometimes I sometimes I sign off too soon, and then people all of a sudden, as soon as I say, okay, we're going to go now, and then lots of questions come. So <laughs> we'll just wait a minute longer and see if there's any other questions that anyone would like to ask. No? Okay, well, thank you very much for your pre presentation, Marianne. It was wonderful, and thank you so much for being so patient with all of our technical difficulties. You and welcome. thank you to everybody who's in the classroom here, or last in my office. I really appreciate you guys coming in and being patient with us as well. So we'll sign off now. Thank you to everybody who logged on to the webinar, and, and I will have this webinar posted in the archives by tomorrow. So if you want to log into the archives, you can access it through our website in the past presentations or archives webinar area. Okay, thank you very much, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you.